Romans 9, 14 through 21, I always use the King James text, and today I read, What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, Even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will, he hardeneth. Thou wilt say then unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? But nay, nay, but O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor. I don't know how they do it in other churches, but this preacher cannot preach without going to the Lord first in prayer. There's this little thing that us old time Pentecostal preachers believe in. It's called the anointing. And I grew up believing that any preacher fool enough to get in a pulpit and try to preach without pleading with the Lord for the anointing, that that preacher was a fool, and I'm no fool. Master, we love you. We thank you. Oh, Jesus, you're wonderful. We feel the presence of God. Even in this place today, as simple as our worship may be, Oh, Master, your presence is real. The power of God is real. Where two or more are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. And today, Lord, we have sensed the reality of this promise. You're here. You're in this place. I need the anointing of the Holy Ghost. If I'm going to preach to the people of God and if I'm going to offer anything that might be of value, be of service to them, then it must be anointed of the Holy Ghost. For the Holy Ghost confirms the word which is spoken in the heart of the hearer and helps us to know that that which we are hearing is in fact and indeed the word of the Lord. Master, touch my mind, touch my lips. But Lord, more than this, touch every hearer. Let every individual today have a heart and a mind that is cultivated as good ground, ready to receive the sown word of God, that it might break forth and grow and prosper and bring forth much fruit to the glory of God. Touch us through your word. Heal, deliver, save. Reclaim the backslider as the word of God goes forth. For we ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. You may notice that during the course of the worship service, I had to take my jacket off. I try not to do that. I like to, I like to keep myself together when I preach. But it's hot <laughs> here in Alabama, so I hope you all will forgive me. When the potter works with clay, the clay can either yield 
to his will and his skills or that lump of clay can be discarded and replaced with a new, more pliable lump of clay. As children of God, we are called to submit ourselves to the will of God. We must be willing to allow the Lord to remake and renovate our very thinking. In Isaiah 64 and verse 8, Isaiah writes, But now, O Lord, Thou art our Father, we are the clay, and Thou our potter, and we all are the work of Thy hand. In Isaiah 29 verse 16, the same prophet says, Surely your turning of things upside down shall be esteemed as the potter's clay. For shall the work say of him that made it, he made me not? Or shall the thing framed say of him that framed it, he had no understanding? In Jeremiah 18 verses 3 and 4, the prophet Jeremiah writes, Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought in Excuse me, he wrought a work on the wheels. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again, another vessel, as seemed good to the potter to make it. One thing, one substance alone makes the clay more pliable makes it possible for the potter to mold it and frame it and to make it into that which he desires and that which he sees for that piece of clay. I've heard sculptors say when they looked at a big lump of rock, you know, a big piece of marble or granite, and they would say, the sculpture was there. I just had to break it loose. I just had to bring it out. But the potter does not have that luxury. <laughs> the finished product is not in that lump of clay. And the potter simply has to bring it out. No, no, no. It's a very different proposition when the potter is working with the clay. Oh, listen to me, children. Everything that clay becomes, oh, hallelujah, is because of the mind and the will of the one who is working it. Hallelujah. Everything that clay becomes, it becomes because the potter did something. He touched it in a certain way. He held it a certain way. He placed his fingers just a certain way so that that clay would begin to take form and it would become exactly what he had in mind for that clay. In Jeremiah, Jeremiah said he went down to the potter's house and there was a piece of clay that ultimately had something about it that just would not allow the potter to make what he was trying to make. So the potter said, well, that's okay. I can work, oh hallelujah. I hope somebody's listening to me today. He said, I can work, listen to me children, I can work with the blemish. I'll tell you something, child of God. Don't you think you've got to be perfect for God to use you? Don't you think everything has to be just right or else God won't be able to use you? I'm here to tell you God knows how to work with some clay that has blemishes. Hallelujah. He may have to change his plan a little. He might have wanted to make you into a beautiful water pot. And instead of a water pot, he might have to make you into a fruit dish. 
church. But one way or the other, he's going to make it so that you're usable. Hallelujah to God. Oh, I want to tell you today, I know that God can use the mired clay. I know he can use the clay that has a tink in it. That has a blemish. How do I know? Well, I'll tell you, because such a lump of clay is standing in front of you today. I remember years ago as a young man, I don't know about you all, but as a young man, I did some dumb things. As a young man, I made some really bad decisions. Oh, I thought I knew it all. I thought I was the perfect Christian. I thought I had it all figured out. I've said it before, I'll say it again, the older you get, the dumber you look as you look back in time. Heavens to her. I look back now and I think, dear God, here I was pastoring my first church at 19 years old. I had no business pastoring a church at 19 years old. There was so much I did wrong. There were so many things I didn't know. There were so many mistakes that I made. But you know what? God used me anyhow. God used me anyhow. He didn't make me the pastor of a mega church. Oh, I'm going to tell you, listen to me, preacher. If God don't make you the pastor of a mega church, maybe it's because you're a lump of clay that he can't make into the pastor of a mega church. And that's okay. There's an old song we used to sing, Brighten the corner where you are. Amen. Do the work that God has called you to do. Minister to those that God has given you to minister to. Give up your notions. Give up your pride. Give up your highfalutin ideas of what you think you're qualified to be. And let the potter have his perfect will with you. I'm going to tell you, I'd rather help ten people get into heaven than a thousand people go to hell. There are pastors today. I have some that I know. I know preachers in my own family who have literally told me about compromise that they have embraced in their preaching. Things that they won't preach because they're afraid it'll scare people out of the church. And they're more interested in the numbers than they are being faithful to the message. I'll tell you one thing about Pastor Charles. And I think looking around this room today kind of bears witness to it. I know what I believe. I know what God gave me to preach. For 31 years I've been preaching it. Hallelujah. And buyer beware. If you want to leave the church because you don't care for one God, then I'm sorry I can't accommodate you otherwise. We'll see you around. I'll still fellowship with you. I'll still hug your neck. I'll still love you. I'm not going to hate you because you leave the church. Don't bother me no kind of way. But if you think I'm going to compromise what I know to keep you here, you're out of your tree. I don't like that you all shout. Well, there's an Episcopal church right down the road. They don't shout. Want me to drive you down there and show you where it's at? I'm not trying to be mean. I'm not interested in pushing people out of the church. I'm not interested in, in you know, uh, I'm not interested in being anything but welcoming and affirming and inclusive. I want to be able to embrace everybody. But honey, this preacher has to preach what I know to preach and there's no compromise in that I can't compromise that just to accommodate the numbers so I've got preachers that I know who have so watered down their message that I don't know if half their congregation is going to make heaven so what good is he doing 
I'd rather get 10 people in through the pearly gate than wind up helping a thousand missing. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. In Ephesians chapter 5, verses 24 through 27, oh, I'm going to read something that irritates a lot of progressive people. I know. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives. You know what that's called right there? That's called a command. Hello now. I don't see Paul making a suggestion. I see him giving an order. Husbands, love your wives. Oh, well, we're divorcing because I just fell out of love with her. Christian, God said through his word, husbands, love your wives. Wives, you know what that tells me? That tells me that we have the ability. Oh my God. We have the ability to find love for somebody. Even if we want to claim somewhere along the line we lost it. God would not command you to do something that you are not capable of doing. Am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. So husband, don't come to this preacher and tell me you want to get a divorce because you fell out of love with your wives. Your wife, uh-uh, sorry. My Bible said husbands love your wife. That means if you go to God and you seek Him, and you try hard enough, I believe God will put that love right back in you. Hallelujah. I met a couple on an airplane many years ago. Many, many years ago. I think I was pastoring my first church at the time. And I was going on a trip. If I remember correctly, I, I was going to Texas to see my mother. I was pastoring my first church up in New England. And I met this couple on an airplane. They were a Christian couple. PTL, Jim and Tammy Baker, they were going through their troubles and there were a lot of things happening. And we began to talk and they said to me, they said, people can talk Jim and Tammy down all they want to. They can criticize PTL all they want to. Said, I hear people saying nasty things about them all the time. They said, but I'm going to tell you one thing. They had such a ministry there. It was a marvelous ministry. It said they ministered to people in areas that churches weren't doing it. Local dioceses weren't doing it. Districts weren't doing it. The lady said to me, she said, my husband and I had become very distant. We were constantly bickering, constantly fighting, constantly at each other's throats. She said, this literally went on for a couple of years. We could not, for the life of us, just seem to overcome this. And finally, we began to talk about divorce. She said, but we were Christians. We didn't want a divorce, but... It just looked to us like the only option we had in the world was to divorce. She said, one day we were, I was watching PTL and Jim was talking about this marriage workshop program they had down there at uh, Heritage USA and how it was changing lives and saving marriages. She said, I called my husband over and he looked at it on the TV and I looked at him and I said, why don't we do this? Why don't we go down there and participate in this marriage workshop? And if that don't work, then we'll see a lawyer. Because God knows at that point we've done everything we know to do. She said, we went down to that workshop. She said, my Lord, I'm going to tell you, PTL was so beautiful. Everything was so lovely. It was comfortable. It was warm. Everybody was loving. And it was such a positive environment. She said, we went into that marriage program. 
And during the course of that marriage workshop program, she said, we learned that oftentimes in the course of our lives, there are all kinds of pressures and all kinds of issues that come upon us from every direction. Our jobs, our families, our children, our finances. She said, and we learned that most couples, the one area they will compromise in the quickest and the easiest is their marriage and their commitment to one another. Because we love to take our partner for granted. We love to think that I can work all kinds of hours. My partner understands. My husband understands. My wife understands. I can do this. I can do that. I can take the kids to all these different activities. And, blah, blah. and my husband will understand. My wife will understand. I can try this business and... If it fails and we go broke and we have to sell the house, it'll be okay, my wife will understand. And we take our spouse for granted. And what happens when things start to go awry in all these different areas, our finances, our families, our children, our jobs, our careers, so on and so forth. She said we learned that a lot of times, the couple will grow apart because all this stuff winds up kind of getting between them. And it drives them apart. She said, but we learned that if we could set our priorities and get rid of all the junk in the middle, that we could find the love we had the day we met and the day we married. This lady sitting there with tears in her eyes on an airplane said to me, she said, I have never loved my husband more than I do right now. And that man looked at me with tears in his eyes and said to me, and I have never loved my wife more than I love her right now. He said, once we got all the clutter out of the way, oh, guess what? The romance was back. The love was back. When Paul said, husbands love your wives, he was saying so, children, because we can do it. We can do it. You can make a choice to love somebody. Don't you go to church with people that you don't much like. <laughs> Haven't you ever been part of a church and you had a character in the church that boy howdy, they just drove you up the wall every time they opened their mouth, every time they said a word. It was just crawling on you and you just wanted to karate chop them right in the jaw. We used to have one fellow in the church years back, bless his heart. He had a way, if anybody in the universe could say the wrong thing at the wrong time to the wrong person, that was his gift and he could get on anybody's last nerve but I loved him we all did didn't we we all did the whole church did we all loved him was it easy no <laughs> it was hard enough to like him but my Bible tells me that believers are to love one another. So that tells me somehow, some way, God is saying we have the ability to make that choice and to make that decision and to make it happen. So we did. Paul said, Husbands, love your wives even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify, listen, and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself. Oh, hallelujah. The Son is not going to present the church to the Father. My God, he's going to present it to himself. Hallelujah. God 
was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. That he might present it to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that it should be holy and without blemish how does the potter create a perfect vessel how does he make that clay yield to his will there is one substance that he needs and only one water oh hallelujah how does the Lord make the church into this glorious church without spot or wrinkle washed in the blood of the lamb how does he make God's people into this wonderful creation through the washing of water by the word. Oh, hallelujah. Honey, I want to tell you something. When you come into the house of God and you hear the word of God preaching and you feel the anointing of the Holy Ghost taking those spoken words and turning them into water. Hallelujah. And that water washes over you. Oh, hallelujah. And it makes you pliable. It makes you flexible. It makes you something that God can mold. Something that God can work with. Yes. That's why faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. James chapter 4 verses 5 through 7. Do ye think that the scripture saith in vain? The spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy, but he giveth more grace. Wherefore, he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Listen, submit yourselves, therefore, to God. See, that clay has to give way. That clay cannot be stone hard and dry. No, once it gets dry, once there's no water, it is what it is. Oh, children, I'm going to tell you, churches are full of lumps of clay today that are hard as a rock. They might as well be a stone because the water, they don't let the water in. They're not interested in the water. Oh, keep the word away from me. I don't like that the word says love your enemies. I don't like that the word says pray for them which do despitefully use you. I don't like that the word tells me I'm supposed to love my neighbor. No, I want to do things my way. I want to do things carnally. I want to do things the way my flesh wants to do them. I've met a lot of rocks in my day. I met a lot of rock hard lumps of clay. God couldn't do nothing with them. They go to church, but the Lord can't do nothing with them. Because ultimately, Tommy, the clay has to be willing to submit itself. The clay has to be willing to surrender itself. Has to be willing to say as the old song says, and we'll sing it later, Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. While I am waiting, yield it. And still, hallelujah. Oh, children, listen to me. You're never going to beat the devil off so long as you're resisting water. You're never going to 
have victory over the enemy as long as you resist the washing of water by the word. As long as you resist the water that is able to make you more pliable. As long as you resist the water that makes you more flexible. As long as you resist the water that makes it possible for the Lord to have His will and His way in your life. As long as you resist that water, you're out of luck. It's not a lot of hope for you. My Bible said to... Sure it does. <laughs> My Bible said, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. What comes before our ability to resist the enemy and walk away the victor. What comes before we can claim victory over the enemy? I'll tell you what comes. Submission to the hand and the working of the potter. Hallelujah. That's what comes. Submit yourselves therefore unto God. Then and only then are you able to resist the devil and have him flee from you. Oh, children, there are some of you been fighting the enemy for years in a number of areas in your life, and you don't understand that the problem is this. You refuse to submit yourself under the mighty hand of God. You refuse to accept God's way of doing things. God's way of approaching things. God's way of having us conduct ourselves. And God's way of having us behave. America is full of evangelicals and fundamentalists today who refuse, refuse to do things God's way. And then like a bunch of chickens in a thunderstorm, they run around screaming, Oh, the devil this, the devil that. Oh, the enemy this, the enemy that. You don't need more political power. You don't need more social influence. You don't need to fight any more culture wars. What you need to do is submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Hallelujah. Learn to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Learn to love your enemy. Learn to pray for them which do despitefully use you. Learn to feed those that are hungry. Learn to give water to those that are thirsty. Learn Learn to go to the hospital and spend time with the sick. Learn to go to the prison and comfort those who are in prison. I'm telling you, if you learn to do things God's way. Amen. America will never be greater than that. Amen. Let me tell you. This nation doesn't need to do things according to your concept of morality. Doesn't need to do things according to your standard of righteousness. Let me fill you a bunch of monkeys in on a biblical truth. I, I'm sorry, folks. I'm on, a, I'm on a real soapbox today, I suppose. Let me fill you all in on the truth that evangelical and Fundamentalist preachers have been lying to God's people about now for centuries. And, excuse me, for decades. In an effort to manipulate them politically, they have lied to the people of God now for decades. They use fear as their primary driver. If I hear one more preacher say, you need to be afraid of this. You should be afraid of that. No, man, my God has not given me the spirit of fear. Hallelujah. I don't need to be afraid of nothing. What are you 
talking about? You lying donkey. Let me tell you what they've been lying about. If we don't turn this nation back to God, oh, if we don't get righteousness back, honey, you can legislate all the morality rules you want. You're not going to change people's conduct. They're just going to do it in private. They're just going to hide it. Remember a little thing called prohibition? Just because they wrote it into the Constitution, the nation didn't suddenly go dry. Mm -hmm. I mean, come on. History's taught us these lessons. But they tell God's people, if we don't turn things around, if we don't get these queers under control, if we don't get abortion stopped in this country, if we don't do this and we don't do that, oh, the judgment of God is going to come down on us and bless God. We're going to be judged by God. And really? That's funny because I don't read that in my Bible anywhere. I see Job asking God, will not the judge of the earth do right? I see Abraham asking God, will you judge the righteous with the wicked? I see the word of the Lord telling us that the time has come when judgment must first begin at the house of God. What does that tell you? I'll tell you what it tells you. God judges the church separately from the world. Do I have proof of this? Yeah, I have proof of this. Lot, his wife, two daughters, came out of Sodom. Am I telling the truth? Noah and his family got on that boat they built, and they rode out the storm. I'm going to tell you how it really works, children of God, so you can tell those fear mongers to get thee behind me, Satan. Let me tell you how it really works. If God has to judge anybody, he will judge them. But the righteous are never judged with the ungodly. Don't you believe they are for a moment? God will lift up the righteous and hold them in his right hand above the fray. That's what the rapture is going to be. God is going to take the church out so he can unleash his fury upon an ungodly world. But before he does so, he will remove the church. So we know biblically that God does not judge the righteous with the wicked. We've seen examples over and over again. Mm -hmm. Oh my. The walls of Jericho came down. All the inhabitants of that great walled city were killed except for Rahab. <laughs> oh, I want to tell you, I can go example for example for example if you want me to, but I don't have time. The Word of God admonishes us to allow the Lord as a potter to remold and to remake us. In fact, the Word of God teaches that as new creatures in Christ Jesus, we are to become as little children. If anybody, if any human being is pliable, and teachable and moldable it is who? a child and the Lord told us we ought to become as little children we are to return to a state of teachableness and willingness to be instructed we must learn as children of God all over again how things are done and how we are to conduct ourselves. Am I telling the truth today? Too many people try to mold the Lord in their image. Meaning they create an image of God. 
and then expect the Lord to conform to their image. Rather than understanding that we are to become as little children. We are to become as clay in the potter's hands. So that we might allow the Lord to remake and remold us in an image that is pleasing in His sight. And in an image... that resembles Him. Oh, hallelujah. I don't need God to look like me. I don't need a worry wart. I don't, I don't need somebody subject to anxiety. I don't need somebody, you know, who gets worked up over finances. I don't need somebody who gets all nerved up when a bunch of foolish people bring a false accusation against them. I don't need God to be like me. I need God to be like God, and I need God to somehow, some way, by the washing of water, by the Word, to help me become more like God. Him. Am I telling the truth today? The question I have for you, saint of God, today is can God remake you? Or must He replace you? Are you a lump of clay that He can work with? Are you willing to submit and surrender and yield to the washing of water by the Word? Or will you resist that washing dry up and become a rock that is of no use to the master whatsoever oh children my question to the church today is remake or replace hallelujah Amen.